So what I'm about to present is a brief excerpt from a book I recently completed with my co-author Lorenzo Chiesa. We have tentatively entitled it God is Undead, Psychoanalysis Between Agnosticism and Atheism. And to cut a long story short, uh, and inevitably in so doing to grossly oversimplify, uh, Lorenzo argues that Lacan is a, an especially principled agnostic on the basis primarily of Lacan's reservations about ontology and any strong ontological claims, including a propos, for instance, the existence or non-existence of the divine, etc. Whereas I, contra this position, argue that no, Lacan is indeed an especially subtle and sophisticated atheist, and this despite all of the different aspects of his work that attract the religiously minded and lead a, a, you know, a not uh, insignificant number of Lacan's readers suspecting that there is, you know, an, in particular, a very powerful Catholic uh, dimension to uh, Lacanian psychoanalysis. So that provides you with a little bit of the context from which this, this piece that I'm going to present uh, has been extracted. The true stringency of Lacan's thoroughgoing atheism is fully on display, perhaps surprisingly, in his engagements with Pascal. This might come as a surprise due to Lacan exhibiting fascination with a historical figure aggressively championing Christianity against all comers at the dawn of modernity. Contra unbelieving debauched libertines, morally lax Jesuit casuists, and rationalist thinkers such as Descartes, rendering the divine just another object before the tribunal of secular philosophical judgment. Pascal upholds the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as an inaccessible, unknowable transcendence to be followed on faith rather than proven or disproven by reason. If Lacan really is an uncompromising and especially virulent atheist, as I contend, then what does he see in Pascal? Do not Lacan's lingerings over Pascal's writings suggest, contrary to my assertions of the former's unwavering atheism, an enduring affinity on the part of Lacan for the religion of his childhood? The famous wager from the Pensee and bearing Pascal's name is what attracts the bulk of Lacan's attention. Lacan's reference, uh, Lacan references Pascal's wager on numerous occasions. Moreover, he devotes a sequence of sessions of Seminar 16 to commenting on this famous bet. He even writes of Pascal's wager that, quote, what it conceals is inestimable to psychoanalysis, end quote. Obviously, the primary puzzle I must solve is how Lacan extrapolates atheistic consequences from Pascal's wager intended by its author to compel even jaded, unbelieving hedonists to change their ways, return to the fold, and at least act as though they faithfully uphold the Christian God's existence. Relatedly, Lacan's occasional sympathetic and even admiring remarks about Pascal might lead some to go so far as to take these as signaling Lacan being receptive to the sort of Christianity defended in Pascal's works. Lacan references other Christian figures and contents, uh, I'm sorry, Lacan's references to other Christian figures and contents certainly appear to encourage some more religiously minded readers to attribute a Christian or Catholic outlook to Lacanian psychoanalysis. But as I'm about to show in the case of Lacan's appropriation of Pascal, such religious, Christian, and or Catholic attributions to Lacan and his teachings are fundamentally unsound and erroneous. Lacan not only sees fit to remind his audience of his atheism while reflecting on things Pascalian, he goes out of his way to stress that, in his view, Pascal's larger metaphysical framework is fatally flawed, and that his attempts to defend the old God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob against the onslaughts of modernity are unsuccessful. But what is it Lacan nevertheless considers theoretically valuable and psychoanalytically relevant about Pascal's wager in particular? The November 20th, 1963 opening session of the abruptly canceled original version of the 11th seminar, Le Nom du Père, contains an important observation about Pascal's God. Therein, Lacan remarks, quote, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not of the philosophers and the scientists, writes Pascal at the head of the manuscript of his pensée. Concerning which may be said what I have gradually accustomed you to understand, 
that a god is something one encounters in the real, inaccessible. It is indicated by what doesn't deceive, anxiety, end quote. After linking the Pascalian divinity to the register of the real qua inaccessible, Lacan's lecture introducing the theme of the names of the father goes on to reflect on Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac and its famous artistic depiction by Caravaggio. This same Lacan also invokes a central thesis from his immediately preceding 10th seminar of 1962 to 1963. According to psychoanalysis, anxiety is the one affect that does not deceive. The Old Testament God of the binding of Isaac fairly can be described by Lacan in his own terms as a transcendent alien real who, in his enigmatic opacity and unpredictable inscrutability, arouses anxiety in his faithful subjects. Pascal himself already emphasizes against Cartesian rationalism and similar epistemologically confident and ambitious forms of modern philosophy and science, God's unsettling unknowability for finite human minds. Starting in seminar 10, Lacan develops an account of sacrifice epitomized by the one Pascal's God demands of Abraham with transformative implications for various conceptions of the divine. For Lacan, Pascal's anxious emphasis on God's inaccessibility and unknowability brings to light the character, not only of the deity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but of gods in general. All gods, given the difference in kind between the human and the divine, are strange, foreign, and at least partly impenetrable. What is more, this divine inscrutability in the context of humans' perceived frailty and dependence vis-a-vis -vis their god or gods arouses anxiety. This anxiety can be expressed in the form of certain existentially pressing questions, such as, what does this divine alterity want? Who or what are we for our god or gods? Are we pleasing to our deities? What do we have to be or do in order to placate them? Of course, religious sacrifices are attempts to curry favor with the divine. The crucial twist Lacan adds to this is his contention that the strategy of engaging in sacrificial practices is not one where the sacrificing subjects are guided by a prior self-assured certainty resulting from the gods having handed down precise dictates and instructions making clear their interests and appetites. The desires of the gods are mysterious and disconcerting, since for believers, everything seems to depend upon whether or not these unknown whims are satisfied. Sacrifice, Lacan claims, aims at, quote unquote, capturing this enigmatic elusive otherness, snaring it by forcing a determination of what it wants via sacrificial gifts. Through the framework of the ritual, the gods are made to desire what is offered to them. Their terribly silent mouths are preemptively stuffed with supposedly appeasing objects. On Lacan's reading, Pascal's wager is a means of coping with anxiety in the face of a deified but cryptic other, a means calling for sacrifice. This wager's sacrificial dimension consists of its participation in a Christian ethic of renunciation. Those who wager on the Christian God's existence and at least outwardly behave as if this God exists bring their manifest behavior into line with Christianity's renunciative ethos in which immoderate extremes involving pleasures and pains are forsaken. Lacan in seminar 12 makes some pointed remarks about Pascal's wager as a combinatory game of chance. He states, quote, the stake is in a way what masks the risk. Nothing when all is said and done is more contrary to risk than a game. The game caps the risk, end quote. Games and game theory are at least as much about minimizing the risk of loss as maximizing the chance of gain. From a psychoanalytic standpoint, games, including Pascal's wager, are inherently defensive. They are ways of containing, controlling, and minimizing risks that otherwise might overwhelm potential and actual players with anxiety, or that already did overwhelm them in the repressed past. Pascal himself and his contributions to game theory mobilizes his considerable mathematical and intellectual talents to circumscribe and rein in what otherwise are unruly contingencies. Thanks to the field of mathematized probability theory, whose foundations are laid in Pascal's correspondence with Fermat, 
the distance between the present and the future goes from being totally opaque to becoming partly translucent. Risks ahead thereby can be foreseen and hence managed. Also in the same session of the 12th seminar, Lacan soon adds, quote, this is the relationship of the game to fantasy. The game is a fantasy rendered inoffensive and conserved in its structure, end quote. This indication raises a number of questions. What risk does the wager seek to mask or cap? What risks might the wager itself run in turn? And what is the fantasy sublated or sublimated, simultaneously defanged and preserved by the particular combinatory game of chance that is Pascal's wager? As for what risks the wager seeks to mask and cap, Lacan provides a hint about this through comparing Pascal's wager to Hegel's celebrated dialectic of lordship and bondage from the 1807 Phenomenology of Spirit. Lacan depicts this particular dialectic as also involving a wager, specifically a gamble on the part of he or she who becomes master by unflinchingly playing chicken with the absolute master, namely death. In Lacan's eyes, the Hegelian master-slave scenario is, as he puts it on one occasion, quote unquote, more honest than Pascal's wager. This is because Hegel's master-to-be really risks complete annihilation without any intimations or prospects of a death-defying existence in heaven or hell. In Hegel, there is a real risk of losing everything with no compensation whatsoever, neither a better life in this world nor an afterlife in another world. Lacan sees Pascal as employing his wager in order, at least in part, to contain and close off this risk of total loss. This is not to say that death is entirely occluded within the parameters of Pascal's wager. If it turns out that the Christian God does not exist, then for Pascal, there is no life after death. Yet, according to the combinatory schema of his wager, the absence of an afterlife still can be paired with either way of wagering, whether for or against the being of the divine. If one wagers that God exists, but it turns out he does not, Pascal and his religiosity contends that one still gains the benefit of living a better life, acting as though God exists. A person allegedly will be happier and more fulfilled in this world by behaving in a God-fearing manner, regardless of whether he or she eventually gets rewarded for such behavior in a heavenly afterlife. Pascal reassures his addressees apropos his wager, quote, if you win, you win everything. If you lose, you lose nothing, end quote, with him soon referring to the latter outcome as, quote, a loss amounting to nothing, end quote. This reassurance is likely what prompts Lacan to depict Pascal as minimizing or eliminating risk and to contrast his wager with Hegel's master-slave dialectic. For Pascal, even if God does not exist, conducting oneself as though there is no divinity, afterlife and the like, results in a miserable life of ennui, unrest, longing, and degeneracy. This is so despite the lack of any punishments inflicting eternal suffering in the infernal abyss. In Pascal's view, the life of the wanton, unrepentant libertine is already on its own a harsh punishment needly inflicted by such a hedonist on him or herself regardless of whether or not there is an omniscient and omnipotent other to mete out ju judgment after death. By simply wagering that God exists and living accordingly, one easily avoids both the possibility of an afterlife in hell, as well as the actuality of a hellish life here on earth. One has nothing to lose, as Pascal himself emphasizes. Yet, as Lacan implies, a wager in which one has nothing to lose is not much of a wager. But what are the precise contours of the life and death risk akin to that run by the Hegelian master, tamed and domesticated within the confines of Pascal's wager and its combinatory of outcomes? What versions of life-threatening dangers does pa Lacan see Pascal as defending against? Lacan drops a key clue to answering these questions in his 10th seminar devoted to the topic of anxiety. At the end of the December 12th, 1962 session of Seminar 10, Lacan explicitly invokes Pascal. In particular, he focuses on Pascal's experimental scientific efforts to refute Aristotelian plenism as per nature abhors a vacuum. After noting Pascal's horror vacui and his foreshadowing of existentialist sensibilities, Lacan comments, quote, 
Pascal touches us still, even those of us who are complete unbelievers. Being the good Jansenist he was, Pascal was interested in desire. And that's why, I'm telling you in confidence, he carried out the Puy de Dome experiments on the vacuum, end quote. He continues, quote, the vacuum doesn't interest us at all from the theoretical point of view. It's almost meaningless for us now. We know that in a vacuum, there can be hollows, plenums, masses of waves, and anything else you like. But for Pascal, whether or not nature abhors a vacuum was essential because this signified the abhorrence that all the learned men of his day had for desire. Until then, if not nature, at least all thought had abhorred the possibility that somewhere there might be a void, end quote. For Pascal, there are fundamental implications for the human condition on a practical philosophical level flowing from the metaphysical and scientific controversies over Aristotle's Plainism. Lacan capitalizes on this, drawing parallels between Lacan, oh, I'm sorry, Pascal's fascination with the topic of the vacuum in physics and Pascal's own recoiling in terror from the silent and largely empty vastness of the physical universe of Cartesian and Galilean scientific modernity. Indeed, Pascal evinces a certain proto-existentialist horror at his own experimental confirmations of the existence of vacuums within a modern image of nature that itself disturbingly appears to Pascal as mostly just one giant cosmic void. Even if the being of nature does not abhor a void, the thinking of Pascal certainly does. Moreover, Lacan draws a further parallel in the passages just quoted from the 10th seminar. This would be a parallel between voids in non-human nature and the void at the very heart of human nature, namely the negativity of Lacanian desire in its precise metapsychological sense. As Lacan notes, Aristotle's horror vacui, as well as the pre-modern pictures of nature of which it is a part, long ago ceased to be of concern to the modern mindset given this mindset's reliance on post-Aristotelian natural science. Ancient and medieval plainism, along with the larger pre-modern notion of nature to which it was wedded, was thoroughly undermined by the progress of the empirical experimental sciences of nature over the course of the 17th and 18th centuries in particular. But as Lacan underlines, Pascal and the Christian traditions on which he relies at the level of their theosophical anthropologies recoil in terror and disgust from a uniquely human void. This would be for Pascal, the inner emptiness driving humans towards enslavement to the excesses of gnawing ceaseless cravings, to the squandering of lives lived perpetually chasing after elusive private pleasures and satisfactions. This inner emptiness is in Lacan's terms, the vacuole of the thing, das Ding, la chose, phantasmatically filled in by the spectral presence of the object cause of desire, namely objet petit a. Pascalian Christianity abhors the black hole-like void at the gravitational center of the human libidinal economy as per psychoanalysis. My reading of these concluding remarks from the December 12th, 1962 session of the 10th seminar is reinforced by what Lacan has to say at the end of the immediately subsequent session of this same seminar. A week later, he brings up the Old Testament God, the deity partly at stake for Pascal himself in his reflections on the divine. Lacan associates this God with the quevoi of the Lacanian other, namely the question of what this subject wants in the face of when confronted by this impenetrable alterity's mysterious opaque desire, a desire that perturbs and animates the subject's own desire in line with the Hegelian Kojevian mantra embraced by Lacan, having it that, quote, man's desire is the desire of the other, end quote. Furthermore, he grounds the subject other desiring relationship in the Freudian Oedipus complex. Finally, Lacan concludes this seminar session by linking the Old Testament God as the other asking, what do you want, with the Greek goddess Diana as Lacan's chose Freudienne of the 1955 écrit of this title. In seminar 16, Lacan, in the context of discussing Pascal's wager at length, goes so far as to claim that the degree of theoretical interest Christianity has for psychoanalysis is tied specifically to its ideas of grace. For Lacan, grace as per Christianity is a sublimated form of what originally is the desire of the mother, a la his version of the Oedipus complex. 
From Pascal's own Christian perspective, the human condition is one of fallenness into the errors and miseries of sinfulness, a condition from which humans can be saved only by the grace of an unknowable and inscrutable God. From Lacan's psychoanalytic perspective, this echoes the ontogenetically archaic and primary state of the young human child being thrown into the world helplessly reliant for his or her very survival and health on the desires as attention, concern, love, etc., of seemingly all powerful bigger others. Accordingly, Lacan repeatedly draws parallels between the desire of the maternal real other of psychoanalysis and the grace of the paternal symbolic other of Pascal. With Christian grace a la Pascal bringing up for Lacan his account of desire, it should come as no surprise that Lacan's reflections on Pascalian thought also mobilize the Lacanian concept of objet petit a, the object cause of desire. Lacan repeatedly maintains that object A is the real central stake of Pascal's wager. How so? Lacan indicates that the gambler who assents to Pascal's wager is making a bet in which his or her own life must be placed on the figurative gaming table in order for him or her to take up this particular wager. Lacan also alleges that one's own life, at least when wagered on Pascal's terms, is rendered equivalent to being an instance of object A. Furthermore, Lacan contends that Pascal wrongly equates the A of one's wagered life with nothing, with absolute nullity. What does all this mean? By Lacan's lights, Pascal's wagerer offers up his or her life as an object, presumably, quote unquote, causing, qua steering and governing, the desire of the divine other, as the objet petit a uh, of the God who may or may not really exist. He or she who wagers on God's existence and indeed acts accordingly, offers up the sacrifice of his or her self-objectified life to a presumed transcendent alterity or authority. This sacrifice entails renouncing earthly life as the libidinal creaturely existence of pursuing one's insatiable passions broadly construed, namely the life of desire, i.e. life qua A. Hence, in Lacanian terms, Pascal's wager objectifies his or her own life of desire as in its entirety an object A, and sacrificially proffers it to a dark, obscure, hidden God who is assumed to desire such a sacrifice. This sacrifice life thereby functions as the object A fixing and directing, that is causing this divine other's desire. Without such fixing and directing, God's desire would remain ominously cryptic and impenetrable like the anxiety-inducing desire of the maternal thing as menacing real otherness, presumably animated by an enjoyment operating lawlessly and unpredictably. This contrasts sharply with the lawful, predictable, rule-governed reign of the pacified or at least pacifiable symbolic other as Christianity's God the Father, himself the epitome of Lacan's paternal metaphor as per the Lacanian Oedipus complex. The combinatory game of the four possible outcomes entertained by Pascal and his wager is, in Lacan's view, a means of coping with and fending off an anxiety ontogenetically originating for all subjects, Pascal included, in the helpless infant's confrontations with the threatening opacity and indecipherability of the desire of the mother qua thing, on which the child is wholly dependent for his or her very life. As seen, Lacan treats this game of wagering and most games in general as defensively managing risk by capturing chance in the nets of mathematical style calculation of probabilities and payoffs. Yet for all Pascal's straining to present his wager as not really a wager, Lacan argues that the same Pascal actually fails to minimize and avoid the sort of risk concerning him. This is where Lacan's ethics of psychoanalysis collides with Pascal's Christian Janssenist ethics. A Lacan I cited a short while ago indicts Pascal's equation of the life of desire, that is life as A, with mere sheer nothingness as false. This Lacan is taking issue with the claim in the pensée that the life of desire, to be renounced by the wagerer who acts in line with wagering on God's existence, is so irredeemably worthless or quote unquote wretched, a word that recurs throughout Pascal's writings, that its sacrifice to God and his laws does not even count as a loss whatsoever. 
For this Pascal, one has nothing to lose but loss and nothingness themselves. By contesting Pascal's religious outlook on this score, Lacan makes the Pascalian game of the wager truly risky, no longer just a game, precisely at the point where Pascal discounts any true risk. In the 16th seminar's extended musings on Pascal's wager, Lacan, as is his characteristic want, repeatedly has recourse to various and sundry formalizations. This recourse is especially appropriate in relation to Pascal, given the latter's contributions to mathematics and the natural sciences. Apropos objet petit a and the Pascalian objectification of life as a, the Lacan of seminar 16 puts forward an equation proposing that one plus a equals one over a, an equation he applies to the subject of Pascal's wager. In having what is added to one through this very addition become the denominator of a fraction with one as its numerator, the larger the number assigned to A, the smaller the sum resulting. In Lacan's equation involving A, addition strangely and counterintuitively results in a sum smaller than the values added to produce it. It seems that Lacanian desire has its own law of diminishing returns. The more living desire repeatedly pursues iterations and incarnations of its object cause, the less one ends up possessing. With objet petit a, it indeed looks as though more is less. As regards these mathematical style assertions concerning desire, the Lacan of the 16th seminar contends that Pascal simply reduces A to zero, the life of desire to quote unquote, infinitely nothing. Yet if one plus A equals one over A, as Lacan also maintains, then Pascal's equating of living desire with absolute nothingness is incorrect. However much one gives oneself over to desire, however large the value of A gets, it will never be the case that one over A equals zero. The lower limit of one over A might be almost nothing in its smallness, but it never becomes completely nothing. Freud famously depicts a therapeutic progress of a successful analysis as a process in which neurotic pathos is turned into ordinary suffering. The Lacan who challenges Pascal's reduction of life as A to nothingness is essentially saying to Pascal that the best humans can hope for is not renouncing their passions, but transforming their desire from being mired in Freud's neurotic pathos into becoming instead a source of much milder ordinary suffering. Correlatively, Lacan also is saying that attempting to sacrifice this one life to live as A, rather than resulting in the gratification of living a satisfying life in this world as promised by Pascal, only worsens and intensifies neurotic pathos one thereby condemns oneself to a hell on earth, namely the misery of a life lived under the lashes of excessive superego inflicted guilt. If God does not exist, but one lives as though he does, then contrary to what Pascal himself says, one has gambled away the virtual nothing of desiring life for utterly nothing whatsoever. Even worse, one is wasted and ruined, even the few small gratifications obtainable in the virtual nothing of this one life in this one world. Instead of successfully avoiding danger through game theoretic risk management, Pascal's wager contains the real danger, obfuscated and denied by Pascal, of a version of making the perfect as Pascal's, quote, eternity of life and happiness, end quote, and quote, an infinity of infinitely happy life, end quote, making this the enemy of, if not the good, then at least the not totally awful and worthless, that is life as a living desire. And Lacan insists that his insight into the inherently barred, inconsistent and fragmentary status of any and every big other indicates that there is no deity worth wagering on along Pascalian lines, a sentiment echoing the virulent atheism of Freud himself. <clears throat> In what could be called Lacan's wager, Lacan suggests to his audience that refusing to give ground relative to one's desire by atheistically rejecting the self-sacrificial giving ground relative to the divine other's desire, as in Pascal's wager, is one's only hope of avoiding condemnation to a this-worldly life of misery and masochism. With respect to Pascal, Lacan likely would endorse Deleuze's now famous warning, quote, 
Beware of the other's dream, because if you are caught in the other's dream, you are fucked, end quote. Moreover, for a psychoanalyst, one has much more reason to fear this worldly damnation at the hands of one's own superego than to fear otherworldly damnation at the hands of a judging deity. Taking into account the analytic clinic of neurotic guilt, the very probability theory Pascal helps invent and utilizes in the calculations of his famous wager would recommend to any chancers to opt for Lacan's rather than Pascal's wager. Lacan's is the better bet. This wager on atheism both makes real ethicality possible, as well as facilitates ordinary suffering in place of neurotic pathos. One should not fall prey to making the improbably perfect the enemy of the not entirely bad, with the latter as, to paraphrase Zizek, slightly more than nothing. Thank you. I'm going to make a brief question, which I hope will be um, excused for being uh, related to some things I want to talk about myself. But Adrian, my, my question is, uh, in your, I, I completely agree, by the way, with 90% of what you said about like how schools can become Pascal and Swager as well as the 10%, the 10% <laughs> or 2% is, uh, you also indicate while following and trace, retracing for us uh, Lacan's critique of a kind of self serving gamble that plays the priorities of the ego basically yes. in, in, and thereby uh, sort of deflates its own subjectivity. Yeah. Uh, you also say in various ways in the paper that for Lacan, there is a, another kind of a wager on the uh, yeah. the wager that uh, the stakes of which are are sauce and the land of security. And uh, you, however, evoking that, also double down on the kind of uh, uh, insistent atheistic position for that uh, one that wouldn't take advantage of uh, the, 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 with that stake in the line that you yourself give here. All gods, given the difference in kind between the human and the divine, are strange, foreign, and at least partly impenetrable. What is more, this divine inscrutability in the context of humans' perceived frailty and dependence vis a vis their god or gods arouses anxiety. How and how powerfully do you want to resist going any further down that road? of reconceiving divinity precisely in the locus of that identity, that anxiety producing vacuum, yes. uh, which is the vacuum of best being. How much will you want to resist that and why? Well, in a sense, it's that I think that when Khan, in, in a particular here, and hopefully my allusions to it make this apparent um, in the talk, that um, I'm drawing heavily on, among other sources, Seminar 7 in particular for some of this. And that, of course, among other things, you know, as, as we all know, that is the seminar in which Lacan first formulates the very idea of Das and you know, come to work with it. Um, and he is, I think, quite clear in the context of Seminar 7 when introducing uh, the concept of Das being extracted from, of course, that uh, well-known paragraph in Freud's 1895 project for scientific psychology, in which you know Freud speaks of the Navy men shall sing. Um, then with that Freud, and then with Lacan's glosses on that Freud in Seminar 7, I think it becomes very clear that for Lacan, there is a very disworldly ontogenetic account in which we can recognize that Dostin is tied to the function of the primary caregiver, um, and in most instances, the quote-unquote mother or maternal figure, to speak more carefully. Um, and looking at that from, and bear in mind that the larger suite of texts that this was extracted from also involves putting these aspects of psychoanalysis and dialogue, and among other things, um, the tradition of Marxist materialism, and even behind that, of course, Feuerbach and uh, you know, the, the whole atheism and Christianity orientation that Feuerbach is, is a, a, a main representative of. Um, and you might recall that Marx, in his 1845 thesis on Feuerbach, in which, you know, along with German ideology, he is carrying out this settling of accounts with Feuerbach. They don't think quite as neat and clean a break as Althusserian would like to make it out to. But that, um, you know, you, uh, 
you have a Marx articulate the complaint in this 1845 reckoning with Feuerbach that yes, Feuerbach brings the heavenly family you know, down to the level of the earthly family, but then he doesn't go further and engage in a critical analysis of the earthly family itself. And I think in Lacan's view, psychoanalysis is that in, in part involves a further extension of that sort of, although not Marxist, its own critical investigation of the earthly family. Um, and that the ontogenetic origins of any deities or deifications can be accounted for in this more bottom up fashion, starting you know, in this very secular banal domain where I see no reason to deploy the language of religion. So that, I, in a nutshell, would I think be uh, you know, why I choose not to go down the path of, well, why not identify uh, Das Ding as itself basically you know, the divine or, you know, something that would have that kind of, of status. Um, you know, I think it takes on that status in certain secondary elaborations, but I think, you know, the origin of this for Lacan, as for Floyd before him, is very much bound up in the situation of things in probabilistic type relative to um, this, this seemingly all-powerful but inscrutable maybe men shall stay. Um, that is the only hope for salvation and can bestow grace for paying attention, et cetera. But those actually counting as grace, et cetera, would be, you know, a later kind of, you know, symbolic or, you know, or, uh, you know kind of secondary working that is, you know, compromised simultaneously with the seals and reveals as a compromised formation, its origins in that very earthly uh, sphere of family life. You'll see in what I have to say that uh, the question I posed was a ball over my own plate. Uh, and uh, But Adrian and I have uh, long debated this, this question of the meaning of uh, the religious in Lacan. And I should preface everything I say by saying that it's far from a yes and no uh, standoff between Adrian and I. Um, I think he is uh, a good deal more committed to a, a really strict and emphatic atheist position. And I am 99 and 9% with him on that. <laughs> But I think I have some one tenth of one percent left that is um, uh, for Adrian worryingly open, um, and I indulge it in this book that will be coming out next well, were we next month. Were we to close it, our friendship would be over. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sustains our friendship. Yeah. <laughs> um, that very meaningful friendship is sustained by this uh, petite difference. Uh, I have a book coming out, and the irony is perfect because Adrian is one of the editors from at Northwestern Press. It's called Embracing the Void, Rethinking the Origin of the Sacred. 